Welcome to The Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mugal, where we interview violinists from around the world. If you're new to the podcast, please be sure to hit the subscribe button so that way you get notified for when new episodes come out. My guest today is an international award-winning violinist, composer, and educator from Jordan and Iraqi roots, a graduate of the Berkeley Global Jazz Institute. He is an in-demand violinist around the world and has been featured on multiple award-winning albums. Please let me welcome Laith Sadiq. Laith, thanks so much for coming on The Violin Podcast today. How are you? Hi, Eric. Thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So we're a little bit we're going to be talking about something that's a little bit out of my comfort zone, something that's not Western classical tradition. So yeah. and, you know, the violin podcast, it was intended to speak about all different violin traditions. So I figured that you would be a great person to talk about what you do and how you kind of formed your career about around the music that you play. But first, let's get to know you. Who is Leith Sadiq? And for people who do not know you on Instagram and are tuning in from around the world, who is Leith Sadiq? Well, as you mentioned, I'm a Jordanian violinist from the Iraqi roots. So I grew up in Jordan most of my, most of my life. Uh, both my parents are musicians. My father is a pianist. My mother is a violinist too. And my father is also the, the director of the National Music Conservatory in Jordan. So as you can imagine, I grew up in a, in a, in a musical family, musical home. I was just going to say a very musical family if there's that, <laughs> that lineage. Yeah, I also, I also grew up in a, in a pretty musical family, although on my dad's side, um, my, my violin teacher was my aunt for like 10 years. So, oh, um, see. yeah. Well, the good thing is also my, both my parents have you know, studied music, specifically Western classical music growing up. My father studied the piano at the Ignatian School of Music in Moscow, uh, very classically trained. Uh, so my upbringing with the instrument was definitely from that background. I did uh, attend conservatory. I did my ABRSM examinations, and I did my scales, my Mozart concertos, my Tchaikovsky, my Mendelssohn. I played all these different things and with orchestras. Um, but of course, growing up in the Middle East, I was surrounded by music from the Arab world, whether it's in house parties, my f family's friends, some events I used to attend. So I was absorbing Arabic music, uh, even when I didn't really know I was doing that. And I remember a very clear moment in one of, when I was about 10 or so, I was practicing in my bedroom and uh, maybe Bach, Alamand or something like this. And I heard the call to prayer from the mosque at that moment. Um, and I was, it's something that I've heard all my life because in Islamic countries, it's something you hear five times a day. Um, and then at that moment I was holding the violin, I started to copy the sound coming from there, which is using specific mod modes or as we call maqamat, the modal practice, the microtonal practice of Arabic music. And that was the moment when I, realize, oh, my violin can speak a different language. And it's not just what I was taught that it could play. So I would say my curiosity with this music started at that young age, but it was only until I got to Boston when I was 18. Uh, that's when uh, I really got deeper into Arabic music. Wow, what a fascinating introduction to that to that world of I, I can't Im I can't imagine what that feeling must have been like where where I guess I can in some way, but where you enter into a space and then all of a sudden there's that that spark moment mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, my gosh, I can do more than just what I've been playing all my life. Yeah. Um, so talk to me about Arabic music and how you got really in um, you, this, that's how you were introduced. But how were you able to. Was it, was it different? Was the tuning systems different? Was the playing style different? I'm sure the playing style is really different based on what I've seen on your Instagram videos. But talk to yeah. talk to us a little bit about your um, your journey as to becoming more intimate with Arabic music on the violin. Yeah, well, as any tradition, especially an old one like Arabic music, classical music, is that it's an oral based tradition. So most of the learning is done by listening. So I think that my training really began at that young age of 10 and even younger, listening to the songs. So the repertoire is very important, much like a jazz musician would be listening to standards growing up and that becomes part of their language, their vocabulary when they play this music. But it's, you know, when I got to Berkeley when I was 18 or 19, in my second year, one of our idol musicians in that world of Arabic music, Simon Shaheen, uh, the virtuoso oud and, and violinist uh, w came to teach at Berkeley. So of course I wanted to study with him. And during those lessons was where we were doing a lot of transcriptions. I was you know, basically copying what he was doing and learning about the different phrases. Because when we look at the maqam system, as I said, the melodic framework of Arabic music, is that 
it has it has very specific movements and and phrases let's say like learning a language you would learn the grammar the phrases of it and you can watch videos but it, the best way to do it is just to learn straight from a master and being in the presence of a master and learning from their humanity too and and their character as well so of course i had to make some adjustments the tuning is different so for the listeners or viewers who are you know who know about the violin we know it's gdae at fifth the tuning on the instrument but the typical tuning for arabic music is a gd gd so the upper two strings are tuned one step down creating kind of a mirror effect of a octave above on the second strings on the top and that helps with many different aspects like the microtonality topic that we talked about for example it helps with the the uh, making the sound of the violin a bit warmer on the upper registers um, and also mimics the tuning of the oud which is another plucked string instrument that is common in arabic music uh, the uh, the ancestor of the lute and um, so there are many reasons why that tuning exists and it it took some time to get adjusted to it um but i think also growing up in a very imp a, a home where improvisation was playing a big role i think i also absorbed that and i'm used to just improvising my way through things and being um what's the word like um it's easy for me to adapt let's say to new situations and that helped a lot with me approaching a new style of music at a later age we touched on many points that i was going to get to but you pretty much said it right 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 then and there <laughs> um you, you did talk about the tuning system of of, of arabic music but also you're talking about how it's passed on an oral tradition and um, i can imagine that a lot of it is folk that where you cannot i mean i've correct me if i'm wrong but maybe some of the music that you that you learned is actually not written down and something passed on from a master to another student that's how it's mm -hmm. passed on right um the the tuning uh, is reminds me of like indian classical music where you don't have the traditional gdae and you have the similar is that i can't remember maybe you might know this better than me but g gd gd for the uh for the way you play arabic music mm -hmm. but is that the same with indian classical music do you happen to know off the top of your head um i do know that they also change the tuning of the strings that um it's not the same as we know it as in the classical western classical sure world. yeah uh, but i i think it's not necessarily a gd gd sometimes it's an a e a e that's changes, the one or, yeah or c sharp g sharp c sharp d sharp depending because c sharp is an important note in that tradition right too. yeah and you, you talk very specifically about microtonality which is uh, microtonality and improvisation. But I want to talk about microtonality first because that's something that us classical musicians, at least for me, that that's like a very nuanced thing where yeah. you're you're kind of you're listening for pitches in between certain pitches, right? And I think that's yeah. what's so unique about um, Arabic music. And that's why I wanted to talk to you to kind of yeah. elaborate on how you hear it from a you know coming from a Western classical music tradition to arabic music can you talk a bit about the sure. how your ears have kind of adapted to this tradition yeah well when we talk about microtonality we think of it as an organism as something that can take different shapes depending on the context of where it is so i can actually demonstrate this on the instrument if that's something that please i would cool. love demonstrations <laughs> and actually you'll be the first no you won't be the first timothy chui was the first one to show us his instrument he was playing on a guarnery but you'll be the first to actually demonstrate so this will be a Ooh. treat for our audience yeah so i'll be playing for you um, i want to show you three examples of um, a, a very simple phrase uh, the first will be in a, just an a major playing a b uh, c sharp and then i'll play an, an a minor phrase a b c natural and then the third one will be a phrase in a maqam called rust, which actually has the third degree as a quarter tone. In this case, it will be an A, mm. B, and then a C half sharp. So I'll play, these, I'll play these three kind of phrases and I'll explain how as a, as a classical kind of, or an, an, an ear that you want to develop your ear to hear that sound, there's a way to actually find it on the violin for violinists, to at least find the placement of it. And then of course, as I mentioned, it's a moving organism depending on what maqam you're in, what piece you're playing, what region in the Arab world, this microtone could change slightly higher or slightly lower as well. Here's the first phrase. Thank you so much for demonstrating. Of course. Stopping on the C sharp, hear it again. Cool, nothing unusual to our ears. Next phrase is gonna be, I'm gonna be playing a C natural now. A minor 
And now in the rust, which will give you a C half sharp. Again. Here's a C sharp. C natural. And then C half sharp. Right there in the middle. Yeah, my perfect pitch ears can distinguish the difference. <laughs> and my goodness, it's it's like such a subtle difference, but it, it's there. Yeah. And as I mentioned, the idea of maqam in this music is a melodic framework. So basically, when you learn a maqam like rust, which I would, with the quarter tone on the third degree and the seventh degree, you never learn it as a scale. So I never took a class in this music and was asked to play the rust like this. Sure. I was I was learning melodies and through those melodies through the repertoire is how you understand how the maqam is formed. So I think that's a very interesting perspective for me that was different from my classical Western classical background where I was learning scales and etudes, kreutzer and so on so on. And then I would apply those techniques on pieces. But in this case it was the reverse. I was learning the pieces first and then understanding how the technique uh, the melodic technique works on it. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think it goes back to what you said about the oral tradition, where first you kind of you, you, you learn by doing and then you kind of then take a step back. You it's kind of like the reverse engineering where you 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 learn the piece and then you reverse engineer it. You learn how you did it and then you teach how the way you did it. Um, and it's very interesting how you said it's an organism. Is there um, are there macabre is that what macabre. i'm am I pronouncing that right are there many different macabre yeah yeah there are many different there's about there's about seven maqam families and each of those families can be macabre. seen as a tree okay. with branches or roots however you want to see it so each maqam can modulate and move between each other so that's where improvisation really i think the music shines a lot in improvisation because once you have the vocabulary the knowledge of these different maqamat then you can easily switch back and forth between them and almost like playing with Lego pieces and creating different shapes. That's really cool. I so admire that. I, that's something that will probably take me a little while to, <laughs> to figure out. Um, I want to transition into improvisation because as I said in the introduction, you attended um, the Global Jazz Institute at Berkeley um, in Boston and I love Boston. Boston's one of my favorite towns and um, and you, you have improvisation embedded in your education and in your upbringing. Um, talk about some of your imp improvisation techniques. Like for me as a, as a classical musician, and sometimes we often get locked into this trap mm -hmm. where, you know, we, we only play what's on the page. And it's very difficult for us to get out of that framework to kind of experiment, experiment something new, whether it's to respect the composer's wishes and play the notes that the composer wrote and everything. So where um, there's a bit of liberty in that. And I want you to hope and can you talk about the, the freedom and the liberty you get in improvisation? Yeah. Sure. I mean, there's two kinds, I would say. The first kind is improvisation as a lifestyle. And I, I lived that growing up because as I mentioned, my parents used to always have guests at home and I would be in the room playing, I don't know, PlayStation, Nintendo, whatever. And they would say, Leith, come out with your violin. I would come out and they would say, play this piece. So I find myself in this moment where I'm, I haven't prepared for completely, but I have the tools to actually get me through that. So I would just find a piece in my head and I would play it and it'll be fine. They clap and so on. So that was a really important practice for me to get to the stage where I am now creating my own compositions in the moment. And for that, which is the second point I wanted to make, is oftentimes when we talk about improvisation, it, you know, you think about it as someone playing freely, just being free on stage, so much freedom and creating ideas out of nothing. While at the same time, there's so much inner structure that's happening inside that person's head, even though they're not thinking about it that way. And I always talk about this when I teach Arabic music, is that um, the, the name for instrumental improvisation is taqasim, T-A-Q-A-S-I-M, taqasim, which means to cut into pieces, which basically means putting something together. And people think, oh, it just sounds free with a drone. You're just playing anything that comes to your mind, which is incorrect because I definitely hear these almost like a stages of a story there where there's an introduction, a development, a climax, and then a descent back to the finale, the cadence. So there are these things there that you can shape in your practice so that when you're actually on stage, it sounds like you're really being 
playing completely freely. I was just gonna say that you're, you know, similar to classical music. You have the rondos, you have the the sonata forms, and everything. So you you also have that where there is a structure in your head, and the te you kind of have like a template. It's kind of like a loose template, I, I can imagine, right? Absolutely. Where you're you're kind of going, you you know the idea of where you're going. However, the journey of that melody or whatever you of whatever you're doing is gonna is eventually evolve into this structure, which is I think it's cool, and I give yeah. every respect for um, for people who improvise because I I just do it terribly. It all sounds like Haydn. <laughs> for me um that's something that my professor used to say it's like you know if i if i if i improvise or try to do something it just sounds like Haydn. um but and i feel the same way too but can you talk about your relationship with jazz because coming from western classical music then going into the um arabic tradition and then going into jazz are there any similarities between all three or none at all. <laughs> yes, I mean the, definitely the similarity in in terms of the when we learned when we when I studied classical music at least my teacher uh, thanks to him that we did talk about it as well from the perspective of improvisation talking about Bach and other Mozart other composers that improvise a lot in their in their cadences or in their actual pieces the way they were created and then Arabic music was of course all about improvisation so when I, I feel there has been a steady growth in my mind and musically until when I get to the moment when I reach the Berkeley Global Jazz Institute where I wasn't really necessarily um, learning to become a jazz musician. That wasn't the purpose of, of, of what the Institute does. But what it does is that it teaches you about the history of jazz. It teaches you about certain harmonic tools, for example, learning about chordal progressions, learning about the repertoire. As I said, it's also an oral tradition, jazz, just like Arabic music. So there's that commonality too. But what I got out of that year of being at the Masters was that I was able to hear my, my I, I actually found my identity at a, at, a, at a much more deeper place than before because I, I saw it from a, from a different perspective and I start to connect the different threads between what, where, does the, where do these sounds of jazz come from, from Africa, from uh, South America, from deep parts of the Arabian Gulf so these connections became a huge part of that year for me. And then I, at the end of it, I released my first album, uh, Son of Tigris, which um, um, I, it's always going to be my favorite, I think, for the rest of my life, because it's the first one. And I put all these the, elements there. The first one is, is your baby. Is the you know, baby, you want to exactly. make sure that you're, you know, the first one is like the most perfect one. And then you can experiment later on. <laughs> right. And I wouldn't say it was necessarily the at least for me personally, that it was the perfect one, but it was the perfect display of who I was in 2016, what kind of person Laith was. And it's just a nice documentation in time of that of that person. So, you know, it's I, I've been open minded enough all my life, thanks to my parents to be able to see connections and everything uh, and to not push things aside because they sound different. So I think that's been one of the qualities that has made me um, find a path um, in, in music and what I do today. You said um, about albums, it's kind of interesting to see yourself back in 2016. You know, in some way, for a musician standpoint, the best time capsule is a, is a musician's album history. You kind of see the progression of how their playing style evolved or e even if it stayed the same. Yeah. So I, I, find that, I find that really cool, really it's awesome. Um, uh, you talk about your albums and uh, something that I didn't mention in the introduction is your involvement in music education. You are um, a professor at Tufts University out in the Boston area. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a bit about what you do there um, and what your goals are with um, your position at Tufts? Well, again, part of the education I got at the Berkeley Global Jazz Institute was, yes, in learning about jazz and learning about other styles, but also was to learn how can an artist become an effective source for positive social change in their community. And I thought, I love education. And I believe I've been gaining experience throughout the years to become a good teacher. And I love teaching. I love my students. So uh, getting the position at Tufts was really um, one of these things that gave me the most motivation and inspiration to do make change and to introduce Arabic music to a new community. So I've been there for about four years now, four or five years. And I have a fantastic ensemble that keeps changing, of course, every semester. But what's, hap what, what's happening is that the ensemble is made up of all these different students from different majors. 
it's not just musicians who are coming or music majors. I have political science students. I have biology students, physics students, math students, all kinds of different aspects, careers. But they want to learn about Arabic music. And this working in that format has also led me to be in touch with the Carnegie Hall this past year. And I'm currently working with them on a really fascinating project of introducing Arabic music and other styles with different artists uh, into the curriculum, music curriculum in U.S. primary schools, elementary schools, and so on. So I think it's a, it's a really great way to make a change to help people open up their minds and their ears to different sounds, different cultures, and find the connections and things. So in many ways, my educational career, I, I almost foresee that it's going to be more important than my performance career. I find that to be the case with me also. Um, you know, the more the more I perform, the more I realize that music education is just a crucial element in not just the U.S. society but in society around the world. I think it's such a such a unique thing that we need to do. It's kind of like the same thing. Um, I was in I was in um, Holland for an orchestra tour back in like 2013, and something that I learned is that kids who are going through the elementary school system have to learn three languages. Mm. They absolutely have to learn three languages in Holland. And I wonder what would the, um, the conversation would be very interesting if everybody had a requirement to learn an instrument mm. or every, there was a requirement to learn a piece of music in music education in public schools. Um, sadly, however, in this country, we oftentimes, you know, talk about the budget and we talk about mm. the deficit. And I think that's not the point. The point is to create kind of more cultural awareness to something that what you're doing, especially with Carnegie Hall and at Tufts University. So I really, I really commend you for that. Um, what's it like bringing other, um, other students from different areas? You know, like, you know, we, you and I, we went to music schools that are yeah. all music. What's it like working with musicians who are studying something else like political science and mathematics, and they come into your Arabic ensemble? <laughs> You know, it's interesting because oftentimes they think that they have nothing to offer in that kind of space. They're just coming to learn something new, maybe learn a bit about the history of something. But once they start singing or they start participating, learning rhythms and so on, something is unleashed inside of them. And it's just, they feel this kind of inspiration that I think doesn't necessarily make them successful musicians in that ensemble, but transfers into their careers. And I've had many stories of people telling me how much this ensemble and other ensembles they've taken have helped them in their own individual careers outside of music. And that's the conversation that needs to be had about why music education is important. Because we are I don't really want a whole society to be fantastic musicians. That's bad for us because we'll lose gigs. There'll be more competition for us <laughs> to, to work. But real talk though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah. So it, it'll be, you know, the idea is that you offer this education because it stimulates certain parts of the brain. It helps in other aspects of life. And it makes future generations, especially people who, let's say, phys physics teachers, doctors, who have will have financial stability in the future to support artistic programs. And if they had in their own experience, if they have lived a very um, satisfactory musical experience or music classroom experience, then they will remember that in the future and they will support artistic programs. So it's a cycle that helps itself, but it needs to start somewhere. And I think it is starting, but it's definitely taking its time. I do agree with you that it is starting. I think you could see that the, maybe the first 10 year, like the first 10 years of the 21st century, like 2000, 2010, there's a very big, heavy focus on mathematics and science. But yeah. I think once we come out of this pandemic, you know, we're still in it. But, you know, as of this episode, it'll be different once we reach maybe February or March. But my right. my intuition, my guess is that there's going to be a big um, emphasis on arts education, because now you have all these people. Um, I think the benefit of music education is that you have the opportunity to be creative. Mm -hmm. And something that I, I want to share, um, I was watching this Korean uh, documentary series, my, my wife's Korean, she's a pianist. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were watching this just just out of random, but I think it's really relevant to this conversation about creativity. There was a person who is a general manager of Lego <clears throat> in Korea. Mm -hmm. And he says that the number one um, opponent for for business is the Korean education system, mm. which I thought was a very fascinating thing because in, in Korea, and of course I'm not Korean, but this is just simply based on what I'm observing, sure. that the education system is a lot of tests, 
a lot of exams, a lot of um, just a lot of like studying and schoolwork. And the, the biggest downside is that these kids don't have the ability to create. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these kids are in middle school, high school, prepping for exams to get into good colleges. But then the creative creativity is what will um, bring them even more success in addition to what they're studying in school. So I think there's something to be said about music education. And uh, I apologize for all my listeners because I probably just lost half my listenership right there. <laughs> um, but anyways, um, let's let's do let's talk about some some fun aspects though. Um, what are some of your favorite uh, moments from the Arabic ensemble? Was there like a moment that really stuck out to you when you were at Tufts where you're like, oh, I'm here and I can't believe this is happening? Yes, I think the concerts for sure, because at the end of each semester, we'd hold a concert at Dissler Hall, a beautiful hall that they have at the music department. And the, usually it's, it fills up with the audience because it's uh, the community, the Arab community is pretty big in Boston too, so they come and support. And it's one of these moments when we were doing a song that was very, it's a very popular song in the Middle East. And then in the middle of the performance, the audience joined along and they start, and I could, I looked at my students and I saw this, this spark in their eyes where that they've never experienced something like this on stage before. And it reminded me of how it felt for me in my beginning stages of, you know, of being on stage and getting applause and so on. It humbled me in many ways and thought, wow, it's wonderful that I could offer these, this feeling and offer this experience to other students. Uh, so definitely the concerts are big moments. Um, you, what you said reminds me of this one book that I was given by a friend called Zen Guitar. I don't know if you ever heard of this book, Zen Guitar. Um, do I have it here? Um, no, I, I think it's I think it's hidden somewhere. But it's it's very interesting because you're clearly a violin master in your own respect when it comes to Arabic music, jazz, improvisation, and you know classical music as well. And what the it, the the book talks about like white belts versus black belts. You know, where you're a black belt, you are a master, you are a sensei, right? And then it's interesting for someone like you and I, we get to see those white belt moments yes. where you're like, okay, this person's a complete beginner or this person just started or this is the first performance that they've experienced. And you're like, ah, oh, wow, I'm able to yeah. pass that on. Absolutely. Again, it was like what you said about the master passing on that oral tradition. Yeah. Now, on the contrary, were there any moments in your career where it didn't go so well on on stage or mm -hmm. in class or in education? Well, yeah, many moments that just didn't go as expected. I mean, you would plan so much for it to go a certain way, whether it's a performance, you play this, you practice this phrase so many times and it just doesn't go well, or you plan for a class and then something happens and it all goes a different direction. But I think I've learned to... Um, I don't know, I've, I've learned to really embrace those moments because it takes me out of the routine that I've kind of formatted myself to go in and it wakes me up almost in a way. So I, I don't mind moments going, you know, not the way I had them planned and many, it happened many times, I would say in my life, musically and otherwise, but those are the moments when you can tell the best stories, I, I would say too. So I, you know, I, I embrace those things. And music is all about storytelling and, um, I do want to kind of transition back into the Carnegie Hall because what you're doing is trying to tell a story through Arabic music, through the Carnegie Hall, um, working with Carnegie Hall. So talk to us a little bit more about that, if you can, more in detail, um, if you're allowed to, of course. Yeah, yeah of course. So Carnegie Hall has um, a music program called Musical Explorers. So they bring three artists each semester from different countries, and they prepare some kind of curriculum uh, from their folkloric music. So I presented two uh, or three Iraqi songs from Iraq and did these videos for them, interactive videos, and the we did some sessions with the teachers uh, from each of the schools, and they used this material to teach their students in the classroom. And we were supposed to have a concert all together in this past May, where all the kids will be in the, you know, we'll have seven concerts, each one with a few hundred kids. But because of the pandemic, we had to do it online, which was, of course, a disappointment, but I'm glad we could do something. And so it was a really great experience for me to try to Think about this really, really diverse and huge world of Arabic music, uh, or especially Iraqi, Iraqi folklore, and condense it down into a, a level where little kids can appreciate and understand it. Um, so it was a nice perspective. And then I was invited again to do a, a kind of a summer music educators workshop where we worked specifically with teachers to bring in this music to their classroom. And it was a much bigger kind of format and with a curriculum. And, and so 
just a great experience and what a, a great responsibility to be working with such a fantastic organization like Carnegie Hall and to bring this music to all these schools. You know, Leith, uh, I just met you today, but I can hear the passion in your voice about how you really do want to bring this change to your community. And I think that's something that we could all learn as music educators and performers that uh, we can continue to strive for perfection in our own craft. But if we're not embracing and we're not creating um, change in our world um, or we're providing new ideas for audiences to think about, I think that's one of our most important roles as musicians is to um, let's say we have an idea and then we provide that idea or unique perspective through music. So I think you're absolutely doing that. Um, I also want to talk about something that you've did a few years ago in, in regards to helping Syrian refugees, because mm -hmm. that's something that I um, that I definitely wanted to talk to you about and got really excited to to read that on your website. So can you talk mm -hmm. a bit about what you were doing um, with your project with helping Syrian refugees a few years ago? Of course. So there's a foundation called Kayani Foundation. Um, Kayani, the word Kayani means my inner being uh, in Arabic. So it's a foundation that has about nine schools in the eastern part of Lebanon for Syrian refugees who are living mostly in camps. Uh, and actually, I got into the project because my wife is working with the Boston Society of Architects. She's uh, part of that team, and they were building a playground for one of the schools. She was part of the design. So that's how I kind of got introduced into the conversation. And they invited me to go travel to Lebanon and host uh, three workshops or two or three workshops there for the students with a select group of students and we learned some songs specifically songs from their background so I taught them Syrian songs because most of the time when refugees get visits from musicians over in different parts of the world they usually would come in and bring in I don't know Bach, Mozart, quartets playing classical music so it's fun and educational of course but at the same time it's not really part of the identity of those kids. They have nothing to relate to so much. So I wanted them to really feel that even though they're living out away from their home, across the border, they can still you know, have something in with them that is still part of their home. And I think a song is one of those powerful tools. So it was a f great, f I mean, one of my most favorite experiences in my life. And to meet those kids and see the talent there, the passion to learn something new. Um, and I wanted to visit again, of course, this past year, but the pandemic has stopped everything. And I look forward to going back again because, um, again, this is what, what I told you earlier about creating positive change and doing the best I can in the time I have to, to offer that to, to as many people as possible. Was the foundation at all in association with like a music school there? Or what, how, how, how did you make that connection? I mean, you made that connection with the... Yeah, anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Well, the, the, the Kayani Foundation has a sister uh, foundation called Friends of Kayani that fundraises usually money and support. And many of those organizers and the board uh, mostly are on, in Boston itself. So that's how I kind of got to meet them. And one of them has seen one of my YouTube videos and got to know me. So that's that. how the connection was made. It was in Boston. In Boston, exactly. And then, of course, I was supported in this trip by uh, Tufts University and Berklee College of Music because they donated money and we, we got to buy percussion instruments and take them. Actually, we bought the instruments from Syrian makers in Syria and we got them to Lebanon. So we still that got to support. That is really cool. We got to support Syrian kind of um, uh, percussion makers and, and help them during this time. That's incredible. I love everything that you're doing and you're creating positive change. You're spreading awareness of Arabic music. Um, you know, just because we're running a little bit out of time, what are some things that you want to leave our audience with today about anything violin related or anything about what you're doing um, with Arabic music? I would say that I'm I'm thankful that I could have this opportunity, this platform to talk about this music. You know, I'm assuming I'm the first person to talk about Arabic music specifically. Indeed and you I are. Would, yeah. <laughs> I would encourage the audience members that uh, just like this podcast to to know that there are other languages the violin can speak and to reach out and understand and, and try to approach those things with an open mind because there's a really wide world and I'm still learning so much about Indian classical music, Carnatic violin, for example, from North Scandinavia, Norwegian folk music or, or Swedish folk music. Fantastic yeah. there that we're not aware of because of the education that we get. Same instrument, different language. Absolutely. It just blows, it blows my mind. Anyways, Leith Siddiq, um, how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about you? Well, you can, of course, check out my website, laithsiddiqmusic.com, or my Instagram or Facebook page is also Leith Siddiq. And I usually am very active on it these days. I'm posting a lot and, and reach out to me if you have any questions or you want to have a chat. Uh, you can, you know, my email is there. 
Excellent. And of course, I'll leave all of those links in the podcast description notes. So if you want to learn more about Laith Sadiq and what he's doing in the world of music, please make sure to go down to the podcast description notes. And if you enjoyed this episode of the Violin Podcast, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe. So that way you get notified for when new episodes come out. And, um, and leave a comment, leave a rating and please leave a comment because it helps the podcast out. It gets to um, be broadcasted to more people around the world. So we thank you very much for that, Laith. Again, pleasure speaking with you and I hope you have a good one. We hope to speak to you soon again on the Violin Podcast. Yes, thanks, Eric.